Hi everyone, it's Sue here, and I hope we have some fun over the next few minutes as we go through a very realistic um, case study. And I know at points it may feel like it's a little bit of a wild ride, but um, it is often the case as we are caring for complex patients who are um, quite unstable medically, that we are, um, in, to use a highly technical term, chasing our tails so that we are constantly adjusting to um, parameters that we're finding. And that's why this concept of titration is so important. There's not a single dose, but we are titrating to response. We're always titrating to response. And do you remember that um, example that we used in the um, titration um, PowerPoint or presentation that is, think of a shower, you're titrating that to response. Too hot, you turn it down. Too cold, you turn it up. You don't say, oh, the, the shower is boiling hot but I'll wait till, um, you know, I'll wait 10 minutes before I turn it down. You immediately respond. Uh, with When we're looking at titration of medications, we may give it a little time. And you remember what we look for is we know the half-life, uh, the peak, the half-life, and we know what we're watching for to have some sense of how we would titrate. Additionally, there's a little bit of a, an art to this. There's the science of these, the use of these medications and titrations, and there's a little bit of art. And it will take time through your experience in high acuity areas um, to develop that level of finesse. You'll have parameters and you'll, you should feel comfortable with those parameters, but also recognizing it's gonna require that judgment about at what point am I, um, have I waited long enough to move something up? You're not gonna get an order that says check blood pressure every three minutes and then determine if you wanna change your dopamine drip. You're going to learn how to respond to that, recognizing the uh, parameters within which that me those medications can be titrated, that response of the patient, again, the half-life and the peak and um, what you're seeing. Okay, so let's get on to this case study. And again, a uh, huge uh, thank you to Kitty Garrett, a wonderful ICU nurse who really helps to uh, bring this to life. Okay, so imagine this is a story. You're part of a rapid response team. You're called uh, to a unit where you've got a 72 year old female. She was admitted to Tele a couple of days ago with a UTI and um, was uh, admitted for IV antibiotics. Now they find her difficult to rouse, her skin is cool. She has a peripheral IV, just a maintenance IV. And remember a maintenance solution uh, can be given at a low rate. So she's got just um, 50 mils an hour of normal saline. And that is used um, as a basic line to keep the vein open so that she has, um, she's, they're able to piggyback those antibiotics. Uh, so what else do we know about her? We take, we have some vitals, heart rate of 110. What do we know about that? Right, above normal. So we've got a tachycardia. Her temp is 39. And if we start to look at, I like to always put them in the correct order. So I would immediately reorder those. I'd say temp of 39, heart rate of 110. That can be a compensatory tachycardia, right? It doesn't, a high heart rate doesn't lead to a high temperature, but the alternate does. A, temp, a high temperature can lead to a compensatory tachycardia. We've also got, uh, potentially, we've also got a high respiratory rate. Um, high temperature uh, has a compensatory response where we, or typically we can increase our respiratory rate, but 32 is really high. Um, and a blood pressure of 75 over 39, right? So that she is hypotensive, dramatically hypotensive. And we've got a calculation here because we don't have a central, any kind of, uh, we don't have um, an art line, a central line, we can't measure her mean arterial pressure. Um, and uh, mean arterial pressure, we can, you can do a calculation. People don't really do calculations. We measure it um, using um, um, hemodynamic monitoring, right, in critical care areas. But if you're looking at um, uh, mean arterial pressure, a change in your cardiac output or your uh, systemic vascular resistance impacts your mean arterial pressure. And so ultimately what we're going to do is make sure that this patient we have some hemodynamic monitoring in place to support the patient to actually get a uh, better um, understanding of what that is, not by calculation, uh, which is always gonna be a rough value, but by actual measurement. Her white count is 26. And we know uh, if we um, take a second, if you don't know any of these values, go back, just take a look. You can always review something. Remember, I'm not asking you to memorize. Although a white count is a good one to know off the top of your head. And we know that's very substantially elevated. So the big question here is, what are you going to do? And remember, we don't make a diagnosis. We don't communicate a diagnosis. We don't write the orders. But we need to know what to anticipate, either to support someone uh, in, in uh, op providing options that may be available. We're always a member of the team to communicate that. 
or to determine if the orders that we're getting seem appropriate. Okay, so first response is gonna be a fluid bolus. Um, and here what we see is two, 250 mils in 50 minutes. So you're gonna take, uh, always you're gonna be running this by pump. If somebody comes into the ER, they don't yet have a pump. You may start that, but every, we've got pumps everywhere, right? So 250 mils over 15 minutes, um, and you're gonna set then your pump to 999 usually, uh, run that over 15 minutes, and we're gonna repeat that twice. And we're gonna keep repeating that until we've got some parameters are, that are met. And these are by um, international guidelines. So always be cautious that we are not um, underdosing our patient with fluid. And I think I've told the story, I always tell the same stories. So I, my apologies in advance if you're bored, but the very first time I took ACLS, um, I killed my patient, my fake patient in ACLS, and all she needed was 250 more fluid because I, uh, she was hypotensive, I gave a fluid bolus, I gave another fluid bolus, uh, just 250, 250, but the patient was 85 years old um, and I was concerned uh, about fluid overload but I wasn't assessing fl for fluid overload effectively enough. I was just um, fitting her into a box about she's 85 years old, how much fluid can I give? She was hypotensive, she needed more fluid. And so um, ultimately she died and what she needed was just 250 cc's. Important to keep in mind, yes, we always watch for fluid overload with older patients, but if a patient is hypotensive and, and shows no signs of um, congestive heart failure or um, fluid volume overload, then that patient uh, can receive fluid. Not the only thing, but absolutely first line we're looking at fluid resuscitation. Now our patient is unresponsive. We've given her some fluid. Um, we're moving her to an ICU. Now we're gonna make sure, remember we talked about that hemodynamic monitoring, right? We're not gonna be calculating formulas. Uh, we're gonna insert a central line and an arterial line. And that way when we've got our um, arterial line, we can have um, uh, pressure transducers. We can really get a much better understanding of what her parameters are. Her heart rate remains 110. Her blood pressure, I can, I, I'm just gonna interrupt for a second. I can hear my little dog starting to growl like she thinks she's a Doberman in the window. If I have to pause this um, to remind her she's a little dog, I will, but I'm gonna try to carry on. So my apologies if we're interrupted here. Heart rate 110 still, blood pressure, 84 over 48 with a mean arterial pressure of 60. And we know this is a measured one. Um, and uh, so her blood pressure has come up a little, but not much considering we've given her a lot of fluid so far, right? Uh, central venous pressure. And again, this is measured now because we've got a central line um, uh, is four millimeters of mercury and it should be where it, it's too low, right? We're looking at eight to 12. So again, what are we doing? She's still tachycardic. She's still hypotensive. Uh, central venous pressure tells us that she is that she remains um, uh, significantly hypovolemic. All right, so we look at um, the SSC, which is the um, uh, Surviving Sepsis Campaign. These are international guidelines, so important that we follow and that we keep up to date because there will always be changes in trends. You know, five years from now, you'll listen to this presentation and you'd think how ridiculous. We expect there to be changes in protocols as we learn new things, right? There absolutely are gonna be changes in protocols, but the Surviving Sepsis Campaign really helps us to keep on top of what the evidence tells us about um, uh, treatment for sepsis and septic shock, which is where we're going, right? Um, so what is it gonna tell us? So we want a CVP of eight to 12. We want a mean arterial pressure of greater than 65. And we want a urine output of greater than 0.5 mils per kilogram per hour. So when we, a normal urinary output is one mil per kilogram per hour. What we say is acceptable is 0.5 mil, mil, milliliters per kilogram per hour. And that's where we get our 30 cc's. So 30 cc's when we say urinary output of 30 cc's an hour, roughly, is not ideal. That is acceptable knowing that it should typically be 60. Okay, what do we do next? Let's just stop here and um, take a look here. This picture is really helpful and it's gonna tell us a little bit about what's happening right down at the, uh, the level of the vessel, uh, our um, blood vessels within a situation of septic shock. And this is prior to that fluid resuscitation. So we've got that tachycardia, right? Your heart is increasing its um, uh, um, uh, rate of contraction because it does not have the volume to um, pump out with each contraction. So it increases the rate to try to compensate for that. 
And so if, uh, if we look at this picture here, over the large picture, what we see is that, um, you know, your uh, the blood enters through the right atrium, um, it goes into the right ventricle, pumps out to the lungs. We've got an increased peripheral vascular resistance. So um, difficulty in getting that, um, uh, that blood flow to the lungs. We also have that entering back into our um, left atrium down to our left ventricle. That is the big powerhouse of our heart. We've got that decreased contractility now of that uh, left ventricle as it's trying to pump out um, through the aorta. Uh, and as we're looking, we've got um, uh, a, um, a decrease in that arteriolar resistance. So um, that uh, the um, um, capacitance and resistance are really about the um, veins and the arteries and the natural sort of pressure and capacity they have. This is essential for a good fluid movement, continuous movement through our body. And so at the very level, if we're gonna look at this right picture, right, the smaller right picture, at the very level of our uh, capillary bed, we have that leaking of fluid out through our um, uh, capillary membranes. So we have a loss of fluid in that third spacing as we move, uh, as that, as we try to get that um, movement of fluid through. So we've got a, um, a increase in um, uh, peripheral vascular resistance. And so when we have that increase in peripheral vascular resistance, um, we also have, we, so what we have is that a difficulty in getting blood back to our heart pumping that blood all the way around and back to our heart. Uh, we also have a decrease in cardiac output. And so we're having a difficult time getting blood out. So on both ends of that cycle, if we think of the heart as the beginning of that cycle, we need that cardiac output to get blood out into that um, circulation. Decrease in cardiac output, which is made up of stroke volume and contractility. Uh, we have a difficult time, a decrease in that in getting uh, enough that cardiac output with enough fluid, at, with enough force uh, to pump that blood around. We also have that increased um, uh, peripheral vascular resistance. So as that fluid is then circulating through our system, as our blood is circulating through our system, we have a, a difficult time then pumping that blood back to our heart. And so it really is a cycle that is um, uh, failing at both ends of that cardiac cycle. So let's carry on. Um, what we're going to do now, we're going to start our titration. So we're going to titrate our IV fluid to our central venous pressure. And so it doesn't mean that the doctor is going to say titrate to central venous pressure. Typically, you're, that you are going to get some volumes to start, and this is happening quickly. But that gives us a measure of how effective our fluid resuscitation is. So we are continuing to give IV fluids, and our central venous pressure is now up to 12. And you remember, we were looking at 8 to 12. The problem here is that even though central venous pressure has come up, her BP is still low. And again, remember, we were looking at that mean arterial pressure and the mean arterial pressure is um, a, um, a relationship uh, between cardiac output and that systemic vascular resistance. So it's still 60, it's still below normal. So we, are, we continue to be worried about that. And in order to support a patient in this type of situation, we need to move beyond fluid because the CVP is telling us that we've managed fluid but now we need to move to resuscitation in a more effective way. And uh, first line resuscitation in a situation like this is gonna be dopamine, which helps to support uh, blood pressure. I'm not gonna really focus extensively on the effects of each of these drugs now because we're gonna get caught up because I'm trying to give you really a situation of how you're gonna, in the case of shock, septic shock, really be working with so much titration and so much change over time. So dopamine is gonna support uh, more effective blood pressure and they're going to start, they've already just started at five micrograms per kilogram per minute. Um, additionally, we're, um, uh, which is a reasonable uh, starting point, you might start it sometimes a little bit lower, but this patient has already gone through fluid resuscitation, other things. Uh, five micrograms per kilogram per minute is a fair starting point. Uh, we get a lactic acid level, and lactic acid is particularly important in looking at sepsis. Uh, other conditions as well, but septic shock is really important. Uh, normal lactic acid level would be 0.5 to 2.2, and here we have 7.8. So again, confirmation of very severe septic shock. Uh, we're giving her oxygen at 40% by face mass. So what are we thinking her diagnosis is? Yes, yeah, septic shock. Okay, so remember I talked about that surviving sepsis campaign. And that really tells us how we move from uh, fluid resuscitation to a variety of different um, 
um, vasopressors, vasopressor medications that are going to support um, uh, blood maintaining her blood pressure. So we're going to start a norepinephrine drip. Three micrograms per kilogram, or uh, three micrograms per minute. And sorry, see, I almost made a mistake. We always have to watch our drugs if they are weight based or not. So the norepinephrine drip is um, starting at three mics per minute. Or we can have a dopamine drip that starts at 10 mics per kilogram per minute. Right. And remember, we started a dopamine drip at five. So it might be that you started at five and we're going to move up quickly here to 10. And for both of them, we're going to titrate to blood pressure. Remember, we're always keeping in mind as we're moving to high acuity care, when we're looking at titrations, it's titrating to response. And in this case, these medications are designed to work uh, to maintain blood pressure. So titrating to blood pressure response. So would I start a norepinephrine drip at this point? As another drug, add it to the, my, my five uh, mics per, per kilogram per minute of dopamine. No, I've already got the dopamine there. I'm going to titrate up, right? Titrate up to 10. Let's carry on. So her BP increases to a mean arterial pressure of 65. And remember, mean arterial pressure is about cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance, cardiac output from the heart, systemic vascular resistance coming back to the heart. Mean arterial pressure is 65, and we want it to be above 65. Uh, CVP is 14. CVP is actually getting a little bit high, isn't it? So that, um, she has a fair amount of fluid on board. And that's where we have to start to be careful that we're, not, we're no longer thinking fluid resuscitation. We're really thinking that we need to respond to this with those vasopressors, right? She starts to become agitated. Her respiratory status, remember we had, she was on 40% oxygen uh, to this point. Respiratory status deteriorates and we have to start mechanical ventilation, right? So she has to be intubated and ventilated. And do you remember we talked about mechanical ventilation? You, um, maybe in the old days uh, when I was an early nurse, I remember uh, that we did not do a very good job in sedating patients. We would always be sedating patients. First of all, it is abnormal to have a, a tube down your throat. Even an NG tube, you see patients trying to pull it out as you try to insert. An airway is that much worse. Um, and heaven forbid, I remember the days we used to restrain patients. I'm so sorry. Uh, and I, I often think about uh, practice changes, right? We, uh, uh, that sometimes we would restrain patients, um, not that they were fighting it with some sedation, but not enough sedation. So now we're gonna start a midazolam drip and that's gonna help her to settle and uh, that's gonna provide sedation, right? And so we're gonna titrate that and Leslie talked about that uh, to a sedation scale that was on our general overview. So where are we at with her now? We've done a fluid resuscitation. We have announced, um, had to um, intubate and ventilate her, me mechanically ventilate her. We've had to increase, we've, we started some dopamine and we had to increase our dopamine uh, to 10 mics by the surviving sepsis campaign. So important that we know these guidelines. Now, because she's agitated, of course, uh, being um, intubated, we are starting a midazolam drip uh, for sedation. Okay, so uh, day three, um, we're looking at, uh, her BUN and creatinine, and we see um, signs of um, renal failure. We, she now has a dialysis catheter inserted and dialysis begins. Uh, she's still on her midazolam at five milligrams per hour, uh, but remain, now she remains agitated. And so now we're gonna put her on a vecuronium drip. Uh, and that's for, again, agitation and management. That's where we're gonna paralyze the patient. So we wanna um, uh, sedate a patient and paralyze the patient. Um, Pressures remain low. And so what we're thinking now, we've done, we've uh, given her, we've done fluid resuscitation and CBP tells us that uh, the problem is not fluid. Um, we've, we've used medications, the dopamine, to try to work with that um, systemic vascular resistance, uh, but we're still not getting where we need to be because those pressures are low. And so ultimately, uh, and our hemodynamic monitoring would give us a lot of in indication here, but the problem must be that contractility of her heart. So we need to really consider what drugs are gonna work with the contractility, right? To support contractility. So again, we can increase fluids and we can look at what kinds of, uh, uh, and what rates of those vasopressors are running. And here we've got the doctor orders uh, dobutamine at 20 micrograms per kilograms per minute. And dobutamine is gonna increase that contractility, right? So 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute, we would look in our uh, drug formula, 20 is, 
uh, dibutamine can start at 0.5 to 1, go all the way up to 20. Uh, under um, serious circumstances, you can go to a very maximum of 40, but usually that um, 0.5 to 1 all up to 20 is that normal range. So we're starting at the very height of that range. Uh, so that would be something to consider, right? Or we're starting right at the very height of that range. Sometimes you would start something in there, but I would consider, and you know where I would go back to? I would consider, I would look up my dobutamine, I would go back to that surviving sepsis campaign. Okay, so we've, we've added the dobutamine, uh, and now with our patient develops um, this rhythm. We're gonna learn this in our rhythms, you don't need to know that, um, but the one thing I'm gonna say to you today is does that look like a normal rhythm that we always show you with that PQRST? It doesn't, right? It doesn't. Now we need to start a drip um, for to um, offset this rhythm uh, that has been caused by that high dose of dibutamine. That high dose of dibutamine has as a side effect um, an impact on cardiac rhythms. And so we've got this dysrhythmia likely associated specifically with the high dose of that medication, the dibutamine that we've given. Um, and so now we have to start another uh, medication, amiodarone, which is a medication that is going to help us to manage her heart rhythm. And again, I don't want to get too, down too much in the weeds, but you see how we're adding and layering. Uh, and the dobutamine, okay, we know the dobutamine has probably led to this consequence. Does that mean I turn it off? No, because even though the dobutamine may be a culprit here, it was, it, the rate of the dobutamine was too high, likely leading to this, but the patient still needed that dobutamine to name blood pressure. Do you remember? We started the dobutamine for a reason. So we can titrate that down. We're still gonna watch how the patient is managing everything because now on top of everything else, her cardiac output is gonna be impacted by this aberrant rhythm. Yikes, right, yikes. Let's catch up. Let's see, where are we? Um, we've got uh, an IV with, and an IV mini bag, right? We've got uh, midazolam or the Versed there. We've got vecuronium running. Do you remember those are sedation and paralysis? Um, we've got a dopamine drip running. I also put norepinephrine here because remember we could have started dopamine, we could have started norepinephrine, right? So I just wanted to, re to remember both of those are, are good drugs. Most likely, I think in this situation, you would have seen a do do uh, dopamine as the first line. We started the dobutamine, we gave her too much dobutamine, uh, and we now ended up with that aberrant rhythm and we had to start um, an amiodarone drip to impact her rhythm. But now we remember we've, dropped her dobutamine and she's got this aberrant rhythm with a decreased mm -hmm. cardiac output. Now we've got a decreased cardiac output again, her blood pressure is dropping again. And we have to add levofed, which is again, another um, vasopressor that's going to um, help to maintain her blood pressure. She also, remember we talked about her CVP. We know that fluid resuscitation was really helpful. It's always first line when we're looking at septic shock but um, she, her, she has a fair bit of fluid, right? So we need to look for another avenue to support um, increasing um, uh, cardiac output through stroke volume, right? So we need some, some stroke volume and we're gonna do that with albumin. There's ups and downs uh, whether, when and where you uh, administer albumin to support a patient. Remember, typically we talk crystalloids. This is a colloid with those large protein molecules that comes with a little glass bottle. Um, so I, again, I don't wanna to get too far into the weeds because these are all gonna change. You're never gonna to have to memorize that. I wanna give you a sense of day by day, shift by shift, hour by hour, things are changing. So, she, uh, so we've started uh, Levofed to maintain her blood pressure now. Dobutamine has come down. Uh, she's, she's got this aberrant rhythm, so we've given her amiodarone, but that aberrant rhythm is giving her much less cardiac output as well as the dobutamine has dropped uh, to give her less blood pressure support. We add another medication for blood pressure support, levofed. We're giving her albumin uh, for fluid uh, as the fluid component um, uh, to try to draw fluid out from third spaces and other, and, and she also has um, uh, uh, another medication that we're gonna add, which is the cardizem, or you may know it as deltiazem, to look at rate. Now, sometimes people might say, wait a second, I'm, I've just started a cardiac med, I've started amiodarone. And now you're asking me to start another cardiac med, cardizem or deltiazem. Can I give both of those? Yes. We are giving many medications and it would be totally fine to say, can I run those drips together? Does it make sense? It makes sense because we're giving the amiodarone to look at the rhythm, right? That rhythm, uh, how, how that electrical conduction 
is occurring so that we have that um, that really good um, um, uh, conduction so that, there, that we have that uh, good compression. And that cardizem or dopiazem to look at the rate, right? So rhythm and rate, both of those would be appropriate in this situation. And we're gonna carry on. Now, um, she's got zero out of four twitches on that train of four nerve stimulator. Do you remember Leslie talked about that again in our titration overview? Uh, and do you remember what, the, what we were looking for when we were looking for those twitches? Do you remember it was the thumb twitch when you put that uh, stimulator there? It was two, right? And so we've got zero out of four so that we know we actually have um, provided too much paralysis. So which drip are we titrating? The vacuronium. Do you see how we're chasing our tails with all of this? Does that mean it's all bad? No, no, it is finesse. This is finesse. We, just because something is set and it was working yesterday or the day before doesn't mean that it's working today or even right now. An hour ago it was fine and now it's not. That is the art and the science of titration. That we are constantly adjusting. So now we've got our vecuronium and we're gonna have to titrate that. And are we gonna go up or down? We've got zero out of four. And we're gonna titrate, we've got too much of that paralyzing agent. Uh, we're going to go to a goal of two twitches. Now we're only on day five. We're only on day five. Um, it's been five days, right? And so she's NPO. Remember, I don't know if I told all of you, my mom had been in the hospital um, last, uh, just came home about three weeks ago uh, or two and a half weeks ago. And she lost about 25 pounds in the hospital in less than a month. Um, she had a terrible delirium. She wasn't uh, eating. She was, first of all, she was confused and refusing to eat. Then she didn't like any food. She was on isolation. They'd bring her a tray and leave a tray or, uh, and not help her, not uh, any. It, so it was, I was so shocked and we couldn't see her. There's no visitors. And I, I, I was just so shocked when I saw her that that could have possibly happened um, in that period of time. We never forget about nutrition. It's so important that we consider nutrition. So um, food as medicine right? Food as medicine as well. So we need to pay attention to this because if a patient starts wasting away, then we're going to have even further trouble um, in recovery. So we're going to start some tube feeds. We do some blood sugars. They're consistently greater than 14. Uh, what do we want them to be? Normal blood sugar would be four to six. Um, we've got a range. We're probably going to have a scale here, right? Um, so we don't just start giving insulin at, at 6.1, but we're going to have a scale, but ultimately we're going to need an, uh, an in, insulin infusion because we're well above the normal range. Um, insulin is going to run with a one-to-one -one concentration. We're going to check, uh, glucose every hour. Insulin infusion requires a dedicated line. We cannot run anything else through that line because the tiniest bolus, let's say you adjust another titration, but you've got insulin there as well. As soon as you turn it up or down, you're, in, you're impacting whether that insulin is getting to the patient at that very steady state that you are um, uh, attempting to attain, right? So it's really critical that your insulin infusion cannot be connected into another line. You've got a dedicated line for that. And we need to be able to make sure that we can give glucose if we have to. So we can give, um, um, if the patient's blood, blood sugar drops, we can give uh, an ampule of B50. We have to make sure that we've got that available. And what are we titrating the uh, insulin infusion to? Again, to response, right? So what would that be impacting? Blood sugar. So we're titrating that insulin drip to the patient's blood sugar. That titration is fairly straightforward only because you're gonna have a very specific parameter. So here we are, I see them smiling. I'm not sure if I'd be smiling because I start to get a little sweaty at this point. Um, not because I'm particularly scared or nervous. It's just, that's, that's me. I always say it's not a party till she's sweating. So I'd probably be looking a little bit like a drowned rat with my hair in a ponytail and a little bit of sweat running down my neck. So we'll show a picture of somebody else. Um, and we see we've got uh, an old um, uh, dialysis machine running here. We've got some uh, uh, albumin running. Do you see the albumin bottle? We've got a whole bunch of drips running. The patient is mechanically ventilated. Um, and, and again, I kept, you say you walk in that room and you're able to say all in a day, right? All in a day. You're, you're going to look at each one of these pumps. The lines are going to be labeled. The pumps are going to be labeled. You know what you're titrating to, what the range is. 
and what your parameters, uh, the physiological parameters that you're able to measure are on your monitor. Okay, so let's carry on. This patient, uh, day five, uh, moving into day six, required increased levels of FiO2 or oxygen and PEEP. That's a measure when you do the ventilation module that you'll learn about, which is positive and expiratory pressure. And so what happens that is that as the, as the, uh, the, um, the patient expires or the natural flow of oxygen or uh, carbon, like oxygen and carbon dioxide out, we keep some pressure so that the lungs don't close completely. And that helps to maintain oxygenation. Uh, she's placed on a specific setting, which is reverse inspiratory expiratory ventilation. And it's just a reverse in the, the amount of the respiratory cycle is, is um, allocated to inspiration versus expiration. She develops a rhythm called PEA. We're gonna learn about this in a couple of weeks, pulseless electrical activity. So on the monitor, we see some electrical activity. She has no pulse, right? So we see some electrical activity. And in the end, it doesn't matter, do I see what I see? Do I see AFib? Do I see, it looks like a normal sinus rhythm. Do I see a bradycardia? Do I see a tachycardia? It's pulseless, right? I have no pulse with that. So I need to pay attention to what I'm seeing, but she's got a pulseless electrical activity. We're gonna call it a PEA. She's got no cardiac output, no um, uh, measurable cardiac output with it. She's unresponsive to resuscitation. And unfortunately this patient passes away. So what could we have done differently? There's just a, I mean, there's a couple of things, a lot of really excellent, excellent work happened here. But in retrospect, and this is always gonna be the situation, whether your patient successfully um, moves out of the ER up into an ICU, moves from an ICU uh, to a step down or to a, a regular uh, floor, whether your patient moves from a step down to a regular floor. However the situation goes, if, if you have a successful um, course of uh, treatment for your patient or if you have an unsuccessful course of treatment, it's so essential that we review our actions and what were the outcomes. So let's think about what we did here. Uh, sepsis is so critical and I just can't tell you enough, which is why you're covering shock here and you'll cover it again. Shock is required in the curriculum by the corner of Ontario regulations because we have to identify shock early. And I keep saying this, I hope I don't sound like I'm bossy or something, but this will save lives. If you're waiting for someone's blood pressure to drop to determine that they are in shock, then go home and do something else for a living. Nurses are vigilant. We monitor our patients in such a way that we determine changes as much as we can prior to that patient crashing. So if we waited till their blood pressure drops to say, oh, it is shock, we've lost all of that period of compensation. Remember, we've talked about those vital signs and watching for that compensation. So our body is working, the human body, the heart, the, all of our um, compensatory mechanisms are working valiantly to buy time. It's our job not to waste that time, right? So we want to watch for early signs. So early identification of sepsis is absolutely critical and all shock, all types of shock. Uh, more fluid. We could have given her more fluid. Remember I told you in, the, in my ACLS, I killed my patient. More fluid sooner. So start that fluid sooner and give her more fluid. Um, that dobutamine, remember we started that dose too high. She went up to the high, the high of the normal range, although it can go all the way up to 40, but she went up, we started a dose of, at 20. Was that where we wanted to start? So important, we looked at that. So that because that dobutamine led to that sequence of events. Do you remember the dobutamine as a side, so it helped her blood pressure, but as a side effect, it led to that uh, um, uh, dysrhythmia, right? Where she had that, that rhythm, I don't wanna talk about it, we're getting ahead of ourselves. She had that terrible aberrant rhythm that we then had to treat with amiodarone and cardizant. Like we, so we, we end, and then we had to go to levofed as an alternate blood pressure maintenance. So we had to then again, chase our tails, right? Chase our tails, trying to catch up with that as opposed to starting with the dobutamine in the reasonable range and then seeing uh, if we needed to titrate anything up or down or add something before we had that uh, uh, aberrant rhythm. Uh, and then again, that in, in, inappropriate use of the neuromuscular blocking agent where she was so, she had no twitch. So we had given her too much of that medication and we had to titrate that. So um, that's where we are in terms of our case study. Um, this, uh, this patient, was, it, sepsis can be catastrophic. We know the rate of uh, morbidity is very, very high with, um, uh, with sepsis, morbidity, mortality and morbidity. So it's, it, you know, it, um, I can't say for sure 
had we done all of this perfectly, this patient would have lived. But in moving forward, if I was involved in this patient's care, the take home message for me would be to make sure I know my ranges, know where my start ranges, make sure I know that um, surviving sepsis uh, guidelines, right? Those are critical guidelines. That's why it's so important that we talk to you about this. Um, and, and recognizing that um, it, within the context of critical care and, and in particular around titration, um, you are going to be, uh, every time you walk in that room, you may not even be leaving that room. You are, it's a moving target. Always thinking titration to response, always thinking what indicators are available to me. So remember we talked about, you can do a mean arterial pressure by a calculation, that's ridiculous. We need to get that patient to the ICU and we need to get some uh, hemodynamic monitoring uh, lines and so that we can actually measure that mean arterial pressure. So it's so important that we really make sure that every patient, we advocate for every patient to get the right level of care at the right time. And I always say advocacy should be a word that has like an echo behind it because advocacy is not a little thing, it's a big thing. Often it's happening at two in the morning, you're waking somebody up, uh, you're trying to explain a situation where, a, where it's an early signs that a patient may be deteriorating and you may have to make that case in a very clear way. Um, and I think one of the things that we'll do in follow-up to this is really talk then a little bit about that SBAR, SBAR reporting. So if we were at the very beginning of the situation, how would we um, uh, provide an SBAR report and even partway through? I think I'm gonna post that for you as an activity and that may be helpful as well. Okay, so I know this was a lot. I wanna say stay calm. Now, maybe you're all calm and you're saying, no, it's not a lot, we've got it all. And if you do, oh my God, I'm so in and I'm so envious and so impressed. Because for me, I still have to think my way through step by step by step, layer by layer by layer. Um, if it has felt like a lot, don't get down in the weeds. Um, I had a couple of questions about how much do you need to know these drugs. Remember, I'm not asking you to memorize all of this. Do you know why? You're not going to remember. That is too much. I want you to focus on the big picture. In this case, we have many different medications that are treating what we are seeing as we are seeing it recognizing that some of those medications have side effects and we may end up with that, um, with that side effect being something that we then further have to treat. It is the finesse of treatment. And we're always then sometimes, remember at one point we took a step back and said, okay, where are we at? And now what do we need to do? It really is important to take that step back, right? Just take that step back and say, okay, what's running? What do we need to do? And even so, for example, the, the VEC, the Vecuron that, was, that, was, uh, that needed to be titrated down so important that in the face of managing blood pressure and everything else, we're not forgetting that we also need to be assessing for that, right? So it, it may be very convenient for us that the patient is lying in bed, not moving, not doing anything, but is it appropriate for the patient? So that neuromuscular blocking agent needed to be titrated down. Anyways, I hope this was helpful. I do say, I, you know, I love it. Um, so I don't, I hope it's not just an activity in me um, just feeling wonderful talking about this magnificent um, situation and the wonders of uh, medicine and nursing care and all that we can do. And even in a situation where a patient doesn't survive, I'm going to make this case today and forever. Um, not all patients survive. Uh, and we do our very best. We do our very best to ensure that the care that every patient receives is um, absolutely uh, based on best practices and it is the right care at the right time. Um, and, also, and for me, when I worked in the emergency department, it was so important that I differentiate. If I said uh, a good shift was a shift where no one died, I couldn't guarantee that that would be a good shift. And I couldn't guarantee that that would be a, a place where I could work because sometimes we can do everything right and it's not enough. The human body in the end is both magnificent, but also fragile. Uh, and so what I would say is a good shift is where no one dies needlessly and a good shift where, is where no one dies in distress, in pain and suffering and other things. So uh, for me in this case, yes, we could have done more, a little bit more earlier. We could have definitely um, uh, recognized sepsis earlier. We could have provided more fluid. The dibutamine dose, I think that was a little bit of a turning point, dibutamine too high. We ended up with the um, dysrhythmia. The dysrhythmia decreased cardiac output. It was inefficient, so uh, inefficient rhythm for cardiac output. And then we needed to give a uh, different medication for rate and rhythm for that. You know, So that's, I think, where we started to really move ourselves um, down a pathway of um, um, poor, uh, poor return, for likelihood of return. Um, but in any case, I think a good example of how it's very hard sometimes to keep up 
on all that you've got uh, going and why it's good to be able to step back for a second and go through all of them and the pathway that has led you here. Gosh, I hope that's helpful. I wish we were in the class together. I wish we were together learning about this and uh, feeling all excited together. But for the moment, this is what we've got. And I hope you're well and safe. And um, we'll just keep talking. <laughs>